Hey, real estate investors, James Wise with Holton Wise. Today's episode of the Tenants from Hell show has got some killer content. We got a fellow by the name of Matt on the show today to share some of his stories from his career as a property manager in the LA area. This guy's an interesting character. He left the property management business and he's been in the reselling business ever since. He's even been on an episode of that show, Storage Wars. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff he's dealt with in his property management career from drugs, a murder, prostitution, gangs, even an illegal ivory bust from an African syndicate. Let's dive in. Don't hold me back. God knows I've been through this before. Matt, I saw you on Instagram. You were posting some interesting comments about some of your tenants from hell stories. You, as I understand it, uh, spent a, a few years in the property management business. You were doing third-party management for other landlords. Is that correct? Yeah, I did it from about 2001 to maybe 2005 in Los Angeles and uh, just outside of Palm Springs for the same company. Um, I did everything. It was the first unit. The first building had 14 units. They were stacked seven and seven, the, which will come up later. Uh, the second one, I managed two properties. One I lived on site and the other one was about a, about a half mile away. And that was a total of 22 units. Um, so I did everything in those buildings. I was, I collected rents. I rented out the units. I did all of the handyman work. I did all of the work. Um, I even ended up taking away, we had painters that would you know, you hire a painter, but I could undercut them. So I painted all the apartments too. So, so you were doing, every- you're doing like management and you're just like hands-on maintenance, like physically yourself, roll and paint, get a little every- bit more, a little bit more money out of the, the yeah. actual owner of the building. He was fine with it because he was saving money by paying me to do it than having to hire a contractor because I could do most of the work. Um, so he was happy. I was happy. I didn't have to get a part-time job because I was working pretty much there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's how you do it when you start in the business, guys. Uh, back in the day, you know, I've pulled some toilets. I've touched some hammers. I did a little bit of that. I haven't, you know, put on a tool belt in years, but that's how you get started in the biz. Now, yeah. you're not in the biz anymore, right? You're out of the biz. What are you doing now? Correct. Uh, I actually run a, I own, started a business uh, four and a half years ago. I run a secondhand thrift store or resale shop. Mostly I'm records. Um, I've got about 5,000 records in the shop, but I do everything. I basically am on the flip side of what you do or what your people do is they buy houses. When you buy a house that's full of every of the last person's stuff, I'm the guy that comes in and buys the entire lot and takes it out, takes it away. I've also do storage units. I've been on TV for storage wars once. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I wanna ask you about that storage wars, but yeah, I mean, when we remove tenants or we go find these vacant properties, man, we find weird shit all the time. I got like a little collection of Buddhas on my desk that we got after we evicted somebody. You have no idea of the weird stuff I have found. If you would like Holton Wise to sell a property you already own in a video just like this one, send an email to sales at boltonwise.com. So that's just what you're buying, right? You're just buying, you know, just random crazy knickknacks. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm buying, I'm buying bulk. So I'm going in, I'm buying the entire house. I come in, look at the house and I say, all right, I'll clear it out in two days. I'm taking everything with me and give them a number depending on what it is. Sometimes it's just a straight clean out. I haven't, I don't do those a whole lot um, with, people that are actually like a lot of times it's deceased like parents have died or something and they don't want to deal with the estate those can be tricky um, because people tend to value their stuff a little more than it is personal attachment Um, but I have gone into houses and just completely for whatever reason was a eviction and gone in and just wiped it out because those are usually bank owned and they just want the house cleared so they can sell it so sometimes I just clean the houses yeah, we actually tried selling a little bit of the stuff we would get from the empty houses here in Cleveland. See, we got about a thousand properties. So we, we gave it a shot. We're like, oh, we got all this random stuff, but we could never get any steam or get enough stuff to devote time to it. It's something you got to do full time. I thought maybe it could be a little offset business. Not yeah, it's, the case. No, you, it's, it's a whole it's a whole other world. I mean, you, you can't you can't try to run that business and run properties. It's just it's just too much. Now, which is more stressful, property management or what you're doing right now? 
Oh, property managing. This is <laughs> what I do now is just mellow. I just get to dig through other people's crap, which is fantastic. That's just entertaining. Uh, yeah. Property managing was tough because we had, I had rough tenants. We were in the, in the first building, like I had no experience. I just got lucky and they, it was an up and coming building, which means it, or up and coming neighborhood, which means it was just a shitty neighborhood. It yeah, was, that means ghetto, guys. Just so everyone knows, uh, that's real. Yeah. Up and coming is realtor talk for straight fucking hood. <laughs> we, I was, so I was on Hollywood and uh, Sunset. Basically, I was. If you, if you're familiar with Hollywood, there's a, there's a Home Depot on Sunset Boulevard. I was two blocks north of that uh, proper of, of, of that home depot. Uh, and it was run by gangs. It was, uh, it, it was a rough neighborhood. It wasn't, it wasn't the worst neighborhood, but again, it was up and coming because Hollywood was pushing that way and they were trying to spread that way. So they were pushing out the bad neighborhood, pushing them further down. And then people like my bosses were buying those properties and trying to rehab them. Um, but it was not fun. I mean, I had one shooting occurred next to the building right before, right next door to me. I heard the shot, but didn't think much of it. And then got up in the morning and there's cops everywhere. And I go and look out. And so I asked to see, to see who it was um, because I knew most of the transients and drug dealers and stuff that went through that neighborhood. I actually didn't recognize him, but it's weird. I, it's seeing a dead body is not what you think it is on TV. Cause if he was shot in the heart, um, but if you're shot in the heart, your blood stops. So there's no blood. There's no, like you see on TV where there's blood exploding everywhere. It's, it's just a trickle of blood right through his heart. His eyes were open staring at me. And I, I will never forget that image. Never. Damn. Now, and that's not the building you manage though. That's the building next door. That was right next door. Yeah. I mean, it was literally 50 feet away from my, my window. But that yeah. just paints the picture of the type of building you're running. And perhaps maybe that's why, you know, currently you're selling, uh, you know, secondhand records and other items because property management man it's savage and this this area you said there's this like gangs tons of gangs over there we were i was lucky enough that one of my tenants um was pretty tight the, the neighborhood that i was was managing was run by what was known as the white fence gang make sure you're subscribed to our investor mailing list we are going to send you an email with the latest investment properties for sale every single day at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can expect a full video offering, just like what you've seen today, in every one of these emails. That's a uh, Mexican gang, right? An, an LA Mexican I, gang? Yes, pretty much. Um, okay. I'm not, I didn't deal with them a whole lot, um, but they knew me and I knew them through my tenant, and he was he was kind of my liaison. And I, I told him, I was like, look, look guys, because I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to go up against white fence gang. I was like, look guys, I'm just trying to clean up this property. I don't care what you're doing. And we were actually right across the street was an elementary school. So I'm looking out my window and looking at an elementary school and I'm looking at people selling drugs and stuff. And I'm like, look guys, I don't care what you're doing here. I just, I said, just do me a favor. Keep the drug addicts out of my neighborhood. That hurts me more than anything. Um, and if, keep the other gangs out and they were cool as long as I didn't I said I'll never rat you out I'm not gonna do anything stupid I don't want you after me and I just want an amicable relationship so I can clean up the neighborhood and they were totally cool um, again I didn't deal with them a whole lot face to face it was mostly my tenant and he went I went through him because they like their animosity as much as I liked my animosity <clears throat> okay so so this tenant then he's got ties to this gang how was he as a tenant, right? Because when I teach people how to invest in real estate, I teach people how to screen tenants. Uh, a member of the uh, white fence gang is typically going to be a red flag that we're going to want to eliminate, but he was actually an asset for you. How did yeah. like that go about? Did you put this guy in your unit? If so, I, what, the, what the hell were you I, thinking? What's, let's hear I it, man. Uh, his mom, he lived with his mom. His mom's name was Faiza. Um, he was a Russian uh, he was probably, I would say at the time, probably pushing 60. Um, and he was a Russian immigrant with his mom. He, the, he and his mom were the last two people out of Russia when they closed the Iron Curtain. Only reason he got out was because he was an amazing electrician. Like you could take him a gum wrapper, a screwdriver, a TV and a radio, and he'd build you a satellite and you'd be able, you'd be talking to Mars. I mean, he was, he was just amazing. He was in and out of prison and the prison, he did really well in prison because at that time you weren't allowed to have, they, they would cut your TV, I guess, in the rec room 
and he could get the TV back on even if they cut power to it. So that's how he got tied with the White Fence Gang. So when he got out of prison uh, for just drugs, he was just doing, he was, uh, he was addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, for the most part, he was a decent guy. Um, he liked me. He wasn't supposed to be there. His mom was the, um, the true tenant and she was section eight. So our building had section eight. And I think section eight at that time was if you're in cahoots with the government for section eight, you have to have 20% of your tenants have to be section eight. So I ended up with four section eight tenants. Um, the man, or the, the owners loved section eight because they always got a check. You know, that their tenants were always going to pay their bill. Um, cause the government was paying them. I did not necessarily like section eight. They were really, really hard to work with for the most part. Um, no. I liked Fiza and her son. They were very cool. Um, but real he was quick, real quick. When you say they were hard to work with, are you referring to the actual section eight program or the folks on section eight? Holton Wise has a worldwide audience of real estate investors. If you are a lender, home inspector, or anyone else with a real estate related business who would like to increase your sales and exposure with an ad in one of our videos, go to holtonwise.com today. The tenants on Section 8. Um, it's weird. They have a very kind of... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they have this, they, they have this belief that, that an entitlement you, perhaps. Yeah, that's the word. They, they have this entitlement where they expect you to, to, to fix their stuff immediately. Now, again, I, I inherited this building and it was rough. Um, uh, off tangent with the Russian real fast. I took over the building. The previous manager for these guys was running a scam on section eight, meaning he was also on section eight, but he wasn't even living in the property. He was running, he was running a prostitution ring out of my, what would be my unit. Uh, and then uh, running, telling section eight that he was living there. So he was getting money from section eight. He was getting money from a prostitution ring. The tenants, he did nothing for them, but collected money, I think for saying he did repairs, but didn't do repairs. Uh, so when I took over, the tenants were already pretty ticked off because nothing had been done and stuff was broken and they wouldn't even come to me because they didn't think that I would, I would, they figured I would just be the same thing as the next guy. So I'd go into an apartment for one thing and I'd be like, dude, what's going on here? Like, Oh, that's been broken for years. Don't worry about it. I was like, no, 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 let's, let's, I'm like, that's what I'm here for. Let me fix this stuff. You know? So it was, it was a tough start for me. Yeah. I mean, it goes from uh, there being hookers in your unit to you. I mean, you know, the, the, <laughs> that fuck, unit. the fuck I just had, goes down. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into when I got that building. I got, like I said, I got lucky. I had no experience. I just put in a uh, resume and said, look guys, everybody needs a chance. Everybody has to start somewhere. I have the ability to use tools and I know how to fix things. I've fixed things my whole life. Um, I'm just looking for somebody to give me a shot. And they did. And I was surprised. And, but I didn't meet them for four months. Um, I went down after they, I did a phone interview, two phone interviews. And the one man, one owner uh, was the owner and manager of a water park down in Orange County, which is about an hour and a half from LA, two hours if you're driving. Uh, and so he just said, come down to the, come down to the water park and I'll have the keys for the apartment. And I assumed he meant he was going to give me the keys to my apartment because I knew that my I needed to be renovated. When I got there, he had already left for the day. His secretary was like, oh yeah, he already left, but here's the keys. And she handed me a busted ass cardboard box full of every key to, to every unit, to every lock in the building and a checkbook and a Home Depot credit card. Again, I had never met them. I was like, what in the world is going on? So I, so I did what I did. I contacted them through phone and email and, uh, told them what I needed. They said, just go to Home Depot and put it on the card. And I push it back the two blocks. I didn't have a truck at that time. So I'm pushing refrigerators and appliances two blocks from Home Depot. And I'm depositing rents for four months before I met them. And those section eight tenants paid checks. Um, but the, a lot of the other tenants, like the African tenants and stuff, they would pay cash because they didn't want anything going on. So I'm depositing, if I remember, I was depositing roughly twenty five to $28,000 a month, and usually twelve to fifteen of it was cash. For me, at 25 or 26, I was barely living paycheck to paycheck. $10,000, $12,000 was a ton of money for me. And I'm just looking at it like, 
wow, that was ten ten thousand dollars would have been life changing for me at that point. I and mean, now you're physically walking this stuff to the bank, this kind of money. You're in a challenging neighborhood. Did that you ever run into any problems, or is your guy that's kind of helping you out with the gang? Oh, okay. Well, you, I drove I drove that I drove the the deposits to the bank, and that because that okay. was that was more in Hollywood, which is a nicer neighborhood. They were Bank of America or whatever, so it was it was a pretty nice bank. But um, I. No, I, again, you didn't, I didn't really see the, the white fence gang a whole lot. You'd see them wandering around. You kind of got the idea who they were, but it was, like I said, it was it just, it's just, it was just so surreal for you. Imagine having no experience and someone saying, all right, here's 10,000 bucks, go, go cash it or go, go deposit it for us. You're like, okay. Uh, it's just weird. It's just weird. It's, they, they had a lot of trust. They had a lot of trust in me. Um, and I, we did good. I really, I really enjoyed working for them because they gave me that much trust. Right. Working in the hood, you had to be resourceful, you know, like you were resourceful, you ended up picking up extra money, painting, befriending a tenant who most people would be afraid of. So that's pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, you were talking about this stuff online, so I liked it. And what I really wanted to talk to you about um, actually is this ivory bust you were talking about. You, you had some tenants from Africa who were busted at your building illegally selling ivory is that is that what you're telling me kind of sort of um they weren't Ill, technically they weren't illegally doing it they were under the under the uh, under the realm of the law realistically so i knew the guys um again i inherited them as well as a tenant so i didn't know them very well i didn't actually know who the legitimate tenant was i had there, I didn't even, I don't know if I even had the original leases because they had been there so long. So they had changed management properties so long. I believe I went through and had everybody sign new leases with the new owners. Um, but I had to leave that with them. Someone filled it out and then they brought it back to me. So I don't, there was, it was, they had a two bedroom apartment and there was always three to four guys there. Um, and they were anywhere from 30 to 50 um and they all they wore the typical uh african garb uh the like like the dresses or whatever whatever you want to call them that's all they ever wore okay. um and they were really cool guys i didn't have any issues with them i talked to them occasionally um and the only time i ever had any ever heard them really was when they were listening to soccer if soccer was on tv if it was the finals um you'd hear them cheering and occasionally you'd see them drinking a beer and that was about it every once in a while i'd see them at the rose bowl flea market because at, at that time i would i was rehabbing some furniture and i'd take it to the rose bowl and try to sell it okay. um, feed them and they were they were one of the tenants that always paid cash first of all uh and I'd see them and they were selling what are known as African wedding beads or um, mostly African beads. And those African beads are usually like this big, they're multicolored, they're glass or stone, they're carved. Um, and they're for African weddings and stuff like that. And people collected them and did different things with them. So I always saw them that. So I knew that they were importing stuff from Africa, clearly. Um, and so one day I'm sitting uh, on my couch and I see someone ring the buzzer. So I open and I can see who it is because I can see people coming up from my door. So I let them in. They come up to my steps. And it's a, if I remember correctly, it was a man and a woman. And they flashed some badges and kind of pushed me into my apartment. And I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And so they pushed me in, closed the door. Did you immediately tell them the hookers were gone? <laughs> I said, it's not me. It's not me. I'm like, it's not. Like, I, actually, I think my response was, who are you here for? Because at that point, I had quite a few tenants that were pretty shady sure, uh, sure. and so they said look here's the here's the deal and they start telling me about how they've got tenants that are are they they've been watching a certain tenant for a while and asked me if i knew who it was and i was like i know where he lives i don't know which one he is and i told him the story there's like three or four of them and they rotate in and out occasionally okay. um, as i'm talking to them i see two swat dudes come up uh full gear out ak's out uh full uh what's the, the full gear just completely decked out ready to get roll with ak's up and then i see behind me because i could see full my apartment. tactical garb full tactical garb then i could see out my window as well that two are going up the side of the building and i'm like oh shit they're going from front of the building and back of the building so that they can't get out wherever i'm like so i'm asking like how serious is this like we don't know um we said we know that they've been selling and importing ivory and and that's illegal and I said, okay, well, what's going on? And they said, well, we're going into their apartment. We want you to know what's going on. Um, and that's about it for now. I was like, okay. So they go in, they bust them, they come out. Two guys come out. There's only two guys at that time that come out 
um, in handcuffs, took them out. Um, and they weren't really worried about it much at all. You could see on their faces, they were not very scared about the situation. So they start pulling out boxes and they're pulling out ivory, just tons and tons and tons of ivory. So they come back, the, the, uh, the, the man and woman come back and one of them is ATF and one of them is uh, fish and wildlife because that ivory falls under fish and wildlife. Uh, and then there's SWAT, which was FBI. So they had, they had the whole world, they had the whole world there. So I'm talking to the fish and wildlife and that was the woman. And she's like, you know what? She's like, here's the problem. She's like, we have never uncovered this much. She's like, we also have a storage unit of theirs that we're going through right now. And she said, they have several, she's like at least a ton, a literal ton of ivory pieces, some carved, some uncarved. And she's like, we don't know how to prosecute it. And so the problem with prosecuting it is there's no, there's. Is that, is no, that, where, is that where the idea for Finder's Vinyl was born? <laughs> were you like, wait a second, I could buy shark lockers <laughs> full of African ivory? Is that, is that the idea? You're like, man, fuck this. This is difficult. <laughs> I said, there's got to be a new way to make money. guns, but ah, cut out the middle, man. <laughs> uh, probably, probably to some degree. All of, all of this stuff leads to where I ended up, so. Uh, and they said, we don't know how to bust this guy. Um, there's no, there's no law for it. There's no precedence. And, um, the problem is, is they have really good lawyers. We already know who the lawyers are because we've dealt They're They're basically following the food chain up, up the supply line to try to get to the top guys. All right. So these uh, guys are, are, are pretty low level in the whole syndicate then, I, obviously. I think they're middle. I think they were middle or higher, um, based on the amount that they had. So... Uh, I guess my question is, right, you obviously you got the low income uh, property, right? A lot of riffraff going on. Are they, if they're higher up, are they living here to just keep a low profile? Because yeah. you look know, guys they're, like you where it's kind of like, hey, guys, as long as you're cool, the rules kind of don't apply because we got to do what we got to do to survive yeah. in the ghetto. They had, they had uh, horrible furniture. They had um, uh, never changed their furniture. They had a, I think they had one car between them and it was just a, a burner. It was, it was just a piece of shit. Okay. Um, they were, most of their money was going back to Africa. Now, I don't know what it was doing. It was going back to Africa. If they were helping somebody or doing something, but, um, I know that they pulled a lot of cash out of that apartment too. And I know that they were, I mean, when I saw them at the Rose Bowl, they were, they were selling, it wasn't like they were just sitting there waiting for somebody to come buy beads. They were selling a lot of beads. Um, so they were, so they were taken, um, and they were, literally back in their apartment within 16 or 18 hours they were back the next morning when i got up they were back in their apartment two of them had been uh deported back to africa but they were back in a month and so i called uh, the atf or the fish and wildlife had given me a card so i called her just to check in and see what's going on and about maybe two weeks later and she called she said yeah she said, it was pretty much what we expected mostly all we were able to do is confiscate it um, we will put a case together, but it'll fall apart because what happens is that because it's coming from ivory, they claim religious freedom. Uh, ivory is used in ceremonies, African ceremonies. So they were able to say that everything was, they were importing it for African, uh, wedding ceremonies, yada, yada, export, export. And that's why if, if you follow ivory laws, ivory is now completely illegal in the U S for the most part, 99%. They've tried to close all of those loopholes. Um, so you can't, so they can't hide behind those laws. Now that was just 2000 beginning of 2018. So it's been less than a year that that law has changed. But, and this, when I managed that apartment, it was almost 20 years ago. So they're still trying to, to stop ivory import, but it was yeah. crazy. I, I was not expecting to see ATF and AKs coming, rolling up into my apartment building. I mean, I, maybe I was expecting to see <laughs> You have come up, but I wasn't expecting them to come up to, for elephant ivory. I was like, well, somebody's probably cooking meth or doing something stupid here, but I would, did not expect it to be an importing ring. Yeah, man, that's wild. I, I've seen a lot. I've seen murder, suicide, drugs, hookers, you name it. But uh, what I have never seen, and that's why I wanted to have you on the show, is uh, an illegal ivory importing ring. That, my friend, is a brand new one to me. <laughs> <laughs> You would never buy a property without a building inspection, right? The thing is, the inspection is limited to the building itself. The profitability of a real estate investment is not just about the four walls and a roof you're buying, it's also about the neighborhood, rental demand, and tenant base. Before you risk your hard-earned money on a deal that you come across on your own, go to HoltonWise.com to purchase a video analysis of that property today.
We've built a completely automated sales and investing process here at Holton Wise. You are able to go from spectator to real estate investor with a few clicks of the mouse. However, we understand that this automated process isn't for everyone. If you have enjoyed all of the free content on the Holton Wise YouTube channel and HoltonWise.com, but want to dive in even deeper with a more personalized investing experience, you can sit down and talk shop with James Wise directly. Visit HoltonWise.com to schedule a one-on-one -on -one coaching session today. When I was in Palm Springs and I had two, two properties, I lived on site on one and the other one, obviously I didn't live on site. The one that didn't live on site only had eight units. So they didn't need a manager on site. And that was a really nice property. Um, but they had, I had a tenant that actually I put, I put in. So this is my bad. My All bad. Right, so, so, until now we've heard about inherited tenants. <laughs> Matt's got to take <laughs> the blame for whatever the hell he's about to tell us this time. My bad. Uh, I take some credit for this. I don't take all credit, but I will take some credit for well, this. You're the only dude that put him in there, man. <laughs> <laughs> I put a woman in there. I put a, a woman in a two bedroom apartment and she was nice. And, um, and she was a good tenant. Um, now she brought her son in, um, who was under 21. He's probably 19 or 20. And she asked me and she even called and said, can he stay with me for a while? I'm like, of course. And I was like, what's, what's a while. And she's like a couple months. I'm like, that's totally fine. I said, um, I, I'm not going to put him on the lease. Um, but you, I mean, you can have people stay at your apartment. I'm not the, I'm not the apartment police, you know, uh, if he's only staying there for a couple, a couple months, fine. Well, it turns out he had a whole lot of problems, um, drugs, uh, in and out of jail, um, and issues, but he was pretty, from my understanding from the tenants, fairly mellow and fairly cool. So much so that they started, he started telling him that he was the property manager for that building and he was doing the repair work and stuff like that. And they were kind of, they were kind of paying him to do stuff. And when I found out about it, I was like, Hey guys, why are you, why are you paying him to do stuff that I would do for you for free? That's my job. And they're like, well, because he said that he's your property manager and handyman. I was like, that is not true whatsoever. Well, he had also uh, been become very friendly with all of the tenants so much so that they had all given him keys to their apartments. Oh. Um, which I was like, and then somebody called one of my tenants called me and, and again, I didn't really know what was going on at this point, And uh, this is all uh, next day news to me. Uh, somebody said somebody broke into their apartment and they had some stuff missing. And I said, well, okay. I said, well, was it, was it broken into? Like, no, but I know that my stuff has been moved and there's stuff missing and I want you to do something about it. I was like, well, what would you like me to do about that? If I was like, who did you give your keys to? And that's when I found out that he may have had a key. And I said, well, cha I'll change the locks for you. I said, but I, I don't know what you expect me. I'm not the police. You can call the police. So like, well, you, you, they thought it was my problem. So anyway. Sure, sure, sure. So again, cops show up um, and one of my tenants calls me and said, hey, the police are here and they're taking that kid away. And so I get over there. And so when, <laughs> when we get over there, uh, the cops inform me that he has keys to every apartment, but he also was kind enough to let himself in when they were at work and took all of their car spare car keys. So he had a set of spare car keys for every car in the lot of all eight cars, almost, I think he had seven car keys and each one of them was for the cars. Um, the reason he was busted is because there was a lot of construction in the neighborhood. He was going through construction sites and stealing whatever he could and reselling it tools and stuff like that. And they busted him with a whole bunch of tools on their patio and all this other crap. So be hey. very careful who you give keys to your buildings to. Make sure you know who they are and change your keys regularly. I changed locks every time someone moved out. Uh, yeah, it's a nightmare. Did you get him out of the apartment uh, shortly thereafter? Or? He was gone. Um, he was once he was once he was out. Um, he was in jail. I, that was his third strike, although a third strike out here doesn't really mean a whole lot. But he was gone for a while. He was gone long enough that she ended up moving out after that. Or or we sold that building. One one of the I don't remember what I don't remember exactly how that ended, but I'm pretty sure I think she moved out. Yeah, because I had another tenant in there was a pain in the ass too. <laughs>
that building was that building was rough uh they they it was a nice building so they thought and it, we we rented them very cheap so they thought that they could run around and, and tell me how to do my job and stuff and then when the management started raising rents on them as you do they got just pissed off and that's where i earn that's where your managers earn your money is you take the brunt for rent raises that's the only thing i always hated is when they raised the rent because you had to go tell the tenants and they're like yeah the owners were always cool about it they're like just tell them it's us we'll be the you can be the good guy we'll be the bad cop just tell them we're just assholes and i was like all right so that was it and real quick before i let you go you said earlier you were on storage wars i used to watch that show all the time uh yeah. What was your experience like on that show? Were you you were on a show regular though, right? No, no, no. I um I, I'm surprised she hasn't said anything in the background. My my great Dane is in the background and she she'll she'll bark occasionally. Um I had taken her when she was a little bit younger, I would take her to auctions because it would give her a little bit of exercise and, and it would help socialize her. She was a rescue, so I was just trying to socialize her. Um, and we don't, when I say we, I mean the locals, the, the people that actually do this for a living that buy and sell storage units. Um, we don't normally go to show tapings for storage wars because there's no point to it. The storage wars, those guys have the ability to spend $10,000 on a unit that's only worth $200 because they can. Um, so for me to waste a day knowing that I'm not going to get a good unit anyway, because they'll, if, if it's a decent unit, they're going to bid it up way, way high because they can take a loss on it because they're on TV. They're getting paid to be on TV. Sure. Uh, so I, but I happened to go to that one. That was one of the first ones um, when they had come out here. It's the Palm Springs episode. I think it's called uh, Too Hot to Handle or something like that. Um, you can see Chelsea, my Great Dane. She's a Blue Merle Great Dane. And then you can see me it, mostly in the background. Um, we left a little early, so I didn't see all of the taping because it was too hot out. I didn't want her, her, her feet on the asphalt. Um, but so the show is, it, the show is everything you think it is. It, it, it's, basically real but it's also embellished much like reality tv is they they are finding stuff in every unit that isn't that is not the case um i know one of the malls the antique malls where they buy their stuff i know people that they where they they stuff that they find in the units they buy somewhere else and stage it basically sometimes they do sometimes they don't and that was the whole dave hester when he sued them because his whole lawsuit was kind of weird but um the show is interesting it's true you go in they open the unit you uh, have five minutes to look. You can't touch anything because basically it's still the tenant's property until the auction is over. So if you touch something, you're breaking and entering. So you can't touch anything in a unit. Um, they bid, you bid, whoever gets a high bid wins it. You close it. You do not, as in, not on the TV show, you cannot touch it until it's paid for. So when they say, well, I'm going to go to this one before I go back to the auction, it's just editing. They're just editing it. Normally they, I have one of my friends actually has been on that episode, on, on a couple episodes and they followed him. Um, you go back the next day and you have to wear the same clothes you were wearing the day before. So it matches TV wise. <laughs> <laughs> Which character was your buddy? Uh, same thing. He was in Palm Springs. His, his name is Craig. They were mostly, they mostly followed him around because his girlfriend, I think it's his wife now is hot. So they were following him around. He was so a like young, a Jared Brandy kind of thing. Kind of. Yeah. 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 There you go. All yeah. right, cool. Well, Matt, Matt, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, sharing some of your stories with us. Yeah, this is savage business and, uh, you know, you're doing something a little bit different, right? You know, what we do at Holton Wise, we talk about, uh, investing, but, uh, you know, Myself, personally, I've never been a on-site manager, so it was pretty cool to hear from somebody who's literally physically in the trenches, on the ground, actually has the barrel of a gun pointed at him due to some uh, issues. And guys, uh, Matt, he's out of the property management business. It's a savage game. He's running his own business now. Matt, you want to give us the info for that one more time before we let you go? Yeah, Finders Thrift and Vinyl is the name of the shop. I'm in La Quinta, California. Um, I'm also on Instagram as Finders underscore Thrift and Finders underscore Vinyl. If you're a record collector, I do ship records out. I will ship stuff off the off the website as well, as long as it's small. I'm not going to ship an elephant ivory tusk to you, but I will ship small stuff. There. Now, Matt, I got a lot of followers. A lot of subscribers are out there in the California area. You care if anybody from uh, the La Quinta area finds anything in a random eviction? Do you want them coming into your shop to see if you want to buy it? Please. I do, have, I, do, I do that every day. 
fire it away. Bring it in. You can send me pictures. You can find me on Instagram. You can call me, do whatever. If it's interesting, I'll buy it for sure. Wow. I can't help but laugh because those stories out of Matt were pretty funny. If you guys liked those stories and you want to see more content like this, more content that just peels back the layers of the real estate investing business, you want to see what this business is really like, not just the money, not just the fortune. I'm not going to stand in front of a private jet or a Lamborghini and tell you everything's sunshine and rainbows. No, guys, if you want to invest in real estate, you got to understand that this business is downright savage and there's going to be some tough times. And that's what I want to do. That's why I bring these stories to you. If you're a landlord out there and you like this kind of content, smash that subscribe button now because I'm going to be bringing you guys stuff like this all the time. On top of that, if you've got some stories of your own, if you're sitting out there and you got a Rolodex of stories like my guy Matt, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. If your stories are interesting enough and I think it's something that the followers are going to want to hear, we can have you on an episode of Tenants from Hell as well. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy. We'll get you booked. F you, Tom. Episode of F you, Tom. F you, Tommy. Turn it around. What? Wow. <laughs> Will you shut the f up? <laughs> Tommy's like, I need a raise. I'm like, F you, Tom. No raise. He's like, Hey, look at this content. I'm like, Double your salary, Tom. I'm like, Tom, just what do you want to make? Or we'll make it happen. Cleveland, Ohio is widely considered to be one of the top rental markets in the entire United States. This is because here in Cleveland, our housing prices are low and our rental prices and demand are high. At Holton Wise, we provide the complete turnkey solution for all real estate investors, whether they are local, out of state, or even abroad. As real estate brokers, we will provide you with agent representation to help you buy properties ranging from single family homes to large apartment complexes. We even have referrals for lenders who can provide investment property loans to investors located in all 50 states, allowing you to capitalize on the use of leverage or other people's money. We have referrals to top-notch title companies so you know that all of your transactions are safe and secure, with every single property being delivered to you with clear title. Once you close on the property, we have an investor-focused insurance brokerage who can handle all your property insurance needs. This insurance brokerage handles auto, home, life, and business policies, but they specialize in working with policies for landlords. We also have full-service property management. We can handle all rental property advertisements, tenant placement, rent collection, evictions, maintenance, landscaping, construction, and repairs. In addition, Holton Wise also offers digital media and education. One day, when you are ready to sell your investment, Holton Wise, as the number one seller of investment properties in the greater Cleveland area, can market your property in a video, just like this one, to our worldwide base of investors who are looking to capitalize on the high cash flow opportunities in the Cleveland, Ohio market. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content, including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from hell. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.